З вами Олександр Сударкін, директор програми MBA, директор програми при MBA менеджмент і лідерство бізнес-школи МІМ. І сьогодні ми з вами говоримо про зміни. Наш гість сьогодні приєднається до нас згодом за 10-12 хвилин. А зараз я хочу розказати вам про те, над чим ми працювали ці півроку, тому що ті з вас, хто будуть приєднуватись до нас на навчання вже цієї осені на програми при MBA, а я сьогодні буду говорити на цьому перш, в перші 10 хвилин про програму, яку я маю честь очолювати, програму при MBA менеджмента лідерства, ви побачите, що якщо у вас було знайомство до війни, то зараз ми дещо доклали зусиль, щоб переробити програми при MBA. Вони стали довшими, вони стали більш цікавими, нам так здається, і ми хочемо, щоб вони, зберігши ту саму інтенсивність навчання, якою славиться бізнес-школа МІМ, давали вам можливість більш комплексно охопити ті предмети або той напрямок, якому присвячена кожна з програм. Тому ми так само оновлюємо і програму МБІ, але вона не є темою нашої сьогоднішньої з вами дискусії, хоча, якщо дивитись на зміни, то так, звичайно, зміни відбуваються і там. Ми зрозуміли, що класичні програми, які говорять про розвиток бізнесу в сталих умовах або навіть в бурхливих умовах, це вже не те. І коли ми залучали е, е, ідеї колег світових, а до нас, на щастя, в партнерство вступають міжнародні лідери бізнесу світи, це наші давнішні партнери, я МД і Карнегі Мелон, то, напевно, єдиний курс, який ми е, не залучаємо в них, це щось на кшталт кризис-менеджменту. Ну, тому що, скоріше за все, викладачі бізнес-шкіл України та й будь-яких шкіл України можуть розповідати про те, що таке, що таке справжня криза протягом багатьох років поспіль. Сьогодні в Києві було декілька сирен. І я розумію, що ми до цього готові, і це не перериває наше навчання. Що нам для цього було потрібно зробити, для того, щоб оце навчання, воно було сталим, воно було якісним. Ми з вами зараз спілкуємося через цифрову платформу, через Zoom. Вона достатньо зручна, і дякуючи компанії Zoom, вона достатньо а, оптимальна для нас. Ми а, за останні а, десь 2-3 тижні опрацювали захищену аудиторію всередині бізнес-школи, тому ви, ми повернулись в той формат, в якому ми з вами е, спілкувались і навчалися з, з вас, хто навчались е, останні місяці пандемії до війни. Це так званий хайфлекс формат, коли більша частина учасників, наших слухачів, знаходиться в аудиторії, але решта – приєднується з будь-якої точки світу, там, де вам зручно. Це дає можливість, якщо у вас термінове відрядження, або якщо ви негарно себе почуваєте, під'єднатися до лекції, а не просто передивлятися її в записі. Звичайно, наш звичний LMS Moodle Learning Management System, де є матеріали, де є все. Але це не серце. Серце, власне, зміни – це сутність програми. Ви пам'ятаєте, що в нас було 5 програм короткотермінових при MBA. Фінанси, управління бізнес-процесами, менеджмент і лідерство, маркетинг та при MBA бізнес. Зараз ми залишили три. Скомбінувавши краще з цих програм завдяки підходу, який ви побачите на наступному слайді. І так, в нас є зараз найбільш розширена програма – це при MBA бізнес. І зазвичай ми говоримо таким чином, якщо розмір вашого бізнесу поки що не вимагає від вас повноцінної дворічної програми МБІ, це може бути малий або початковий середній бізнес. Це може бути бізнес, який знаходиться в одному регіоні України. То для вас програма при МБІ бізнес якраз. Бізнес-аналіз – про це буде розповідати Олексій Віноградов на одній з наступних інфосесій. А, власне, при MBA менеджмент і лідерство – це та сама моя улюблена, сама софтова програма. Програма, де здебільшого йдеться про людей. Вона е, пройшла через певні системні зміни. 
Що це, власне, за зміни? Це е, класичні бізнес-предмети, так зване ядро навчання 80 годин. Це немало достатньо. Да, і зараз ви побачите, що це саме за предмети. Та, е, власне, предмети лідерства та менеджменту, які частково є в ядрі, і частково спеціалізовані предмети на кшталт управлінської психології, яких, які є в менеджменті і лідерстві, вони залишились там. І симуляції ми, чесно кажучи, вагались, але залишили про Марк Страт, маркетингову стратегію. І того в нас є програма, на, яка завершується створенням плану власного розвитку. Ми все ще впевнені, що найліпший інструмент керівника – це сам керівник. Це не машини і механізми. Це ті навички, які є у вас. Це ті якості лідера, управлінця, які є у вас. І саме тому, коли ми говоримо про те, який диплом або який проект захищати на виході, то фактично ви захищаєте проект розвитку себе як керівника. Там є певні нюанси, і ті з вас, хто підуть на цю програму, ви будете це бачити. Я можу сказати, що люди, які пройшли цю програму, це Астарта, багато хто за старти проходив. Вітаю, колеги, якщо ви дивитесь. Це а, значна кількість лідерів фарм галузі. Це колеги з управлінської команди фонду «Повернись живим». А, це не бізнес, бо вони не заробляють, але з точки зору управлінського розвитку, напевно, такий стрибок в управлінській структурі з трьох кімнат до трьох поверхів і з бюджету, який вони опрацьовували цілий рік, на такий самий бюджет, який вони тепер опрацьовують протягом двох тижнів, це для будь-якої організації непросто. Не і знаєте, хлопці і дівчата, я пишаюсь тим, що ви робите, тому що ви як управлінці показали свою зрілість. Я сподіваюся, що ми з колегами, які працювали, на програмі менеджменту лідерства. Десь це наша заслуга. Але тепер оновлена програма. Що, власне, ми туди додали? На екрані ви бачите, що є низка предметів з менеджменту. Це і системний менеджмент, це і стратегічний менеджмент, менеджмент це і менеджмент проєктів. Тобто к управлінню ми підходимо з різних сторін. Ми говоримо тут про е, залучення е, фінансування, джерела фінансування бізнесу і про звітність, яка буде супроводжувати залучення фінансування. Тут буде і фінансова звітність, тут буде і контролінг, і тут будуть, будуть і такі предмети, як маркетинг-менеджмент, як управління змінами, як управління персоналом в кризові часи. Тобто ви бачите, що ем, деякі предмети з програми менеджменту лідерства перекочували в те ядро, яке зараз вивчають всі. Але спеціалізовані предмети, які притаманні самі програми менеджменту лідерства, це кроскультурний менеджмент, бо значна кількість з нас зараз розуміє, що ми спілкуємось із всім світом і будемо продовжувати це робити. Та наша кандидатура в членстві в Європейському Союзі – це лише формальна частка того, тої географії, де зараз знаходяться українці і українки. Ми будемо говорити про організаційну поведінку, класичний курс, де ми будемо розуміти, що людина веде себе на одинці не так, як людина в групі, і не так, як людина в організації, і як цим всім управляти. Це, власне, сутність програми «Організаційна поведінка». Ми будемо говорити про практичну психологію управління, тому що ем, керівник управляє людьми, і ми абсолютно точно знаємо, що людьми не можна управляти е, одним, як всіма, всіма, як одним. І для нас практично психологія управління – це той предмет, де, е, який дає тонке налаштування ваших управлінських якостей. Ми будемо говорити про управління компетенціями або системний розвиток е, людського капіталу в організації. Е, в нас буде чудовий курс, який традиційно веде українка, яка живе в Іспанії, Анна Маковнікова, управління віддаленими командами. Ми будемо працювати з Іриною Золотаревич в управлінні конфліктами. І ми будемо говорити так само, як і раніше, про особисту ефективність керівника. Зокрема, це курс по переговорам, курс під курс по презентаціям і, власне, курс по лідерству під Олени Юськовою так само ем, всередині цього проекту. Тобто ми намагались е, утримати ядро 
компетенцій бізнесмена і дати спеціалізацію, яка дає вам можливість управляти людьми. Так, це зміни, і е, впроваджуючи ці зміни, ми тримаємось принципів, які нам дають наші акредитаційні агенції, і ми говоримо про те, що ми продовжуємо співпрацювати попри війну з акредитаційними агенціями, які дуже ретельно перевіряють якість нашого викладання. Для чого ми це робимо, друзі, для вас. І е, з, окрім традиційних управлінських проєктів, навчальних проєктів. Ми, ви знаєте, започаткували ще низку безкоштовних проєктів. Це наша ділянка фронту, наш економічний фронт. Це величезний проєкт Reinforce, де ви будете, ви мали можливість почути Ювала Ноя Харарі, ви будете мати можливість послухати видатних мислителів, таких як Філіп Котлер. Є проєкти МІМ «Економічний фронт», де ми спілкуємося з практиками бізнесу. Є проект «МІМ Тулбокс», де ми говоримо про інструменти е, утримання стресу. І різні телеграм-групи, де колеги допомагають один одному. І ось в рамках одного з цих проєктів наш сьогоднішній гість. Я його представлю українською, а потім ми перевед... перейдемо з ним на англійську. І я попрошу тих з вас, хто хоче продовжувати слухати нас українською, натиснути кнопку «Переклад» в вашому Zoom клієнті для того, щоб наша шановна колега, яка нас чує, могла нас перекладати з англійською на українську. І так Алекс Будак. Він соціальний підприємець, він ем, викладач відомого, відомої школи Берклі, Берклі Хас, і нещодавно е, він випустив свою книгу, яка і лягла в основу нашої сьогоднішньої зустрічі, е, стаючи е, тим, хто впроваджує зміни. Це е, непросте непросте рішення, да? як, е, як ставати е, тим, хто впроваджує зміни. Так, до речі, зараз я подивлюсь, чи він приєднався. Поки що не бачу його. Тому, ага, є, бачу вже. Окей. Е, він е, веде дуже цікавий курс, з якого ми і почнемо, бо мені дуже цікаво, а як можна викладати курс по трансформації. І е, він є керівником е, програм Executive Education, програм для бізнесу. Він також практик, він соціальний підприємець, він достатньо значну кількість часу витрачає на викладання, на консультування, отримав декілька нагород, так що сьогодні наше з ним, наше з ним спілкування буде про його підхід до впровадження змін, і я хочу запросити Алекса Будака. Алекс, хай! Would you mind joining us? Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Good evening. Thank you so much. I'm not... Uh, do you mind if uh, I see two of you? One is on the screen and the second is on the slide. I didn't realize I'm wearing the same shirt today Excellent. as in the photo, so, so we I didn't, didn't... Mean to do that. Excellent, excellent. Okay, um, do you mind talking a little bit more about yourself? Because I did a brief introduction of you in Ukrainian. And uh, now please speak about who you are. Thank you. Well, it's the best Ukrainian introduction I've ever had. Uh, and now in English. I'm a social entrepreneur. So that combines social impact and traditional business entrepreneurship. And now I'm a faculty member at UC Berkeley's Haas School of Business. My passion is helping people learn how to lead positive change from where they are. So I work with entrepreneurs, with innovators, with managers, with leaders, with engineers, all to help them figure out how they can become better leaders and how they can make a difference where they are. So wow. as Alexander mentioned, I teach this class at Berkeley called Becoming a Changemaker. It's a joy and a privilege. And just as of last week, I turned it into this book. And I realized that the colors are perfect. It's Ukrainian colors on yeah. the cover. 
That's <laughs> sweet. Um, when I hear, thank you. Uh, you know, when I hear about change, I hear mostly positive things like we need to change and change gives you money, fame, success, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, probably you will agree with me that um, people resist change. But then I want to ask you why, if people understand that change is necessary and inevitable, why people resist change? It's such an important question, especially to begin our conversation. So the researchers, the behavioral economists, Samuelson and Zeckhauser did original work in the 1980s and developed a concept called status quo bias. And they found that even when the alternative is better, we tend to prefer things the way that they are. Change can feel scary. And we as humans have a natural intention to want to keep things the way they are. We're scared of what could happen, even when it's better. So that means that we as change makers need to recognize that, that even if we ourselves find change easy or important or inspirational, we need to use empathy to put ourselves in the shoes of others and say, okay, maybe I like this change, but maybe my assistant or maybe this manager won't like change quite as much. And what can I do about that? All right. Uh, I understand that you've learned changed and uh, change was, yeah, let me probably, I will open it uh, with a slide um, as soon as we come to the second part of our discussion, when you will be talking about Canvas, your approach. But here, I understand that in your book, you're, um, you were examining a number of cases about change, right? What's your favorite? Could you talk a bit about that? Sure. There's over 50 cases in the book. So a wide variety of technology, entrepreneurs, managers, but one that I like quite a bit because it's not the way we normally think about leadership. It's the story of Gwen Yi Wong, and she's a change maker based in Malaysia. Hmm. She's the founder of a company called Tribeless that builds communities and works with executive teams. <laughs> By all outside measures, she was thriving. The company was on the front pages of major American newspapers. She had tons of business. It was growing rapidly. It was every entrepreneur's dream. But inside, she felt like it wasn't quite right. She was waking up tired, and not inspired to go to work. And from the outside, we would think she has everything. But on the inside, it just wasn't the way she wanted to be leading. So she decided after a number of difficult conversations to step back to no longer be CEO and to instead take on a chief product officer role. Her other co-founder stepped up into the CEO role and she stepped back. The reason I love this story is that I teach a concept in the book called confidence and humility. We often think as leaders that we should be a little bit confident and a little bit humble, kind of in between. But actually, I make the case we need to be a lot confident and a lot humble, that when we're just a little bit of each, we don't really stand out, we won't get change done. Now, you don't want to just be confident if you're not humble. Then you become arrogant and people don't want to work for you. But you also don't want to just be humble. You would never start a company, never lead change if you are all too humble. And so Gwen was both. As change makers, we often need to do two opposite things at the same time, be confident and also humble. So Gwen stepped back and she took on the chief product officer role. And the timing, it turns out, was perfect. She stepped back in February of 2020, one month before COVID, right before her team needed to completely change its product and its revenue model. Because she could focus on the product, she allowed the pivot into a completely virtual remote company. 
which then allowed the company to pivot to even new heights. That would not have been possible if she was either too confident to keep on the job or too humble to never step up in the first place. Well, that's an interesting case. Um, developing qualities for a leader, for a change maker, is, is an issue that takes practice. And I understand just by reading, only some people can change. What tools do you use in your class to help people change? Yeah, it's one thing to understand intellectually about change or about a concept. So I make my students actually experience it. One example is we learn a lot about failure. So many of us are scared of failure. But the truth is to lead any type of change, we need to get comfortable with failure because we will, of course, fail if we do anything hard, anything new. Alexander, as you mentioned at the beginning, people don't like change. So we are destined to fail at least a little bit when we lead change. So in my class, we spend two hours talking about failure. We do case studies, we learn empirical research, and then towards the end of class, I give them just two words, go fail. And students start laughing and they wonder what, what's happening. And then I say, yes, really, you have 10 minutes and you have to go leave the classroom and you have to ask for something and get rejected. You can't come back to the classroom until you have failed. And my students are so nervous. These, like your students, high achieving, excellent academics, but sometimes scared of failure. So they leave the classroom nervously. They go outside on campus and they start asking for things. 10 minutes later, they come back and the energy is incredible. They're laughing and jumping around. They are so excited at what just happened. And what they learn is two things. One, about one third of people ask for something. They're sure that they will get rejected and they actually get a yes. There was one woman who went to the school cafe and said, hi, can I have a free orange juice? And the person at the cafe said, okay, and gave her an orange juice. And she said, uh oh, I'm supposed to be rejected. Let me ask for another one. So she said, okay, can I have two orange juices? And he said, yes, okay, that you had two. And she said, okay, can I have three? And then he said, no. <laughs> but she, she came back to class with two <laughs> orange juices. Then for the other group, they find that failure isn't that scary, that it's okay. No one laughed at them and they came back just fine. So that's a way we can experience failure actually in person instead of just reading about it. Fantastic. It's outside of class, which I really like, and it's learning something you're not supposed to learn. You're supposed to experience after the class. Um, one of the things I like about teaching adults, especially, I use some case studies. And when we use cases as a teaching method, I know a group of people will not like it. Those who get all A's at school because they are ready that there should be a predestined um, answer. And when they understand that there is no right answer, they're like, no, that's, that's, that's not right. And say, yeah, but do you have a right answer in your life? They say, no, I say, so. And they're like, okay, let it. So that's how it started. Fantastic. Do all people change after your class or there are some that still resist no matter what? Good question. Um, so I'm an academic. And so, of course, I wanted to study this. There's no one that's really studied change making as a concept. So along with a colleague, I launched the first ever longitudinal study of change makers. We study how people develop over time as change makers. Before students take my class, they take something called the change maker index. And then after the class, they take the index 
and then every single year, every June afterwards. So we can study how do change makers develop? And I went into it with curiosity. I just wanted to know, do people become change makers? And the data are clear, absolutely, statistically significantly, people become change makers. Now, of course, there will be the occasional person who maybe only improves a little bit or stays flat in their development. But at a population level, it's very clear that people can become change makers, absolutely. Now, this change maker index um, research is, is something. I've noticed that you have another term that really drew my attention because I've heard another one that is similar. And uh, the term I mean is micro leadership. We all know micromanagement and normally it's not a positive term. Actually in my class in organizational leadership, I say that micromanagement is necessary if it is used at the very beginning of some process when you have to be on somebody, when you have to control everything that person does. If a mother is not micromanaging its kid, that can be scary. But if she's micromanaging him or her after he turns 20, then yeah, it's not good, of course. But okay, micromanagement is understandable. What's micro leadership? Thank you. What a great way to frame up that question. And in many ways, it's the opposite to micromanagement. So when we think about leadership, we often think about the one heroic act. You know, today we think a lot about your president who's an incredible leader. We think about Steve Jobs. We think about Elon Musk. And when we think about these types of leaders, we often think, well, that's not me. I'm not extroverted. I'm not charismatic. That can't possibly be me, and so I can't be a leader. But I don't believe that. I believe that all of us can practice leadership. And so micro-leadership takes this concept of leadership and breaks it down into its smallest actionable unit, which I call a leadership moment. So if you think about your life today, you've had 10s, 20s, 30s, leadership moments all around you. A small chance where you could step up and do something. A chance where you could make things a little bit better for someone around you or have just a little bit of courage to stand up and lead. Mm. What's powerful about micro leadership is that it's accessible to all of us. If you're a student, a new employee, or even an executive, we can all seize those leadership moments and all lead change from where we are. And then from the manager perspective, it's the alternative to micromanagement. Because with micromanagement, we often control all the details because we're scared what will happen if someone goes too far. We stop managing them and who knows, they will go launch a new product we don't want them to launch. Well, the good news with micro leadership, they will never go too far because it's only small little steps at a time. And you can encourage those small steps because together, one step isn't that much. One moment isn't that much. But collectively, all together, that's where you have a lot of impact. Mm. You know, uh, it brings up my memory into a phrase that one of my teachers always gave me at his class. He said, um, a leadership moment number one is when an interaction between a leader and a follower, when a follower had failed. Mm. And as soon as a leader says, what's wrong with you, it all stops. Mm. If he says, okay, we have failed, let's examine and let's do it better next time. And then he gave it knowledge of how to do it, et cetera, says, this is the critical moment, number one, your behavior when your follower had failed. And that's it's really important. And I remember one of the stories in a company where um, a group of organizational consultants was examining why their um, productivity went down because everything else was fine. And then one of the consultants noticed that on the carpet, there was a spot and uh, he, he said, I've, I think it was something there, was it? And one of the um, leaders said, yeah, 
uh, we had an employee. She wasn't really an employee. She was like a volunteer. And she was um, sorting our mail that was back in the time when it was a uh, paper mail. And But she retired. She was like 60 when she came in just to spend one or two hours a day. And then she turned like 70 and she decided to stop. And this, this guy, he asked, what did she do? She said, no, nothing. Just said, hi, have a good day. And hi, how are you today? You look great. He said, these are the moments when the morale of the company was lifting up and nobody had noticed it until she was gone from the company. Mm. Wow. That's uh, now I understand what a micro leadership is. It's so very important and so easy to do. Probably like humor. I think you were talking about a role of humor and leadership and in change making. I know that humor can be uh, regarded as a defense mechanism if talk about it seriously. But we're not really academicians here, right? We're talking about practical side of humor and change making. What do you say about that? Do we need to laugh when we change? Oh, I think it's so important. I, I love that idea. It gets people off of their defensiveness and reminds us that things aren't always so serious. Jennifer Aker, who's a professor at Stanford Business School, actually wrote a whole book about the power of humor in business. And I think the same thing comes for change as well. Um, if we as leaders don't take ourselves too seriously, it makes it more comfortable for our teammates to also embrace change. Wow. Um, okay, uh, general ideas are fine, you know, laugh and um, lead the change and stop resisting, but then, when I get to this idea of uh, introducing a change in my class, I always hear something like, okay, I understand the idea. What do I need to do? And I think that you have a wonderful tool to um, be practical about change. What do you call it and why? Oh, thanks. Yeah, I call it the change maker canvas. And I found exactly the same thing that you found, which is that a lot of people in my class, even those that start skeptically, they come and they say, okay, I want to lead change, but it feels really overwhelming. Maybe it's, I want to lead a digital transformation at my company, or I want to launch a new product or a new service. I want to change the way that our company does something. Uh, they feel inspired, but they feel really overwhelmed. And I've heard this time and time again, and change makers I've worked with all around the world. After hearing it from so many change makers of every age, every industry, agribusiness, technology, IT, all across the board, I realized, okay, everyone feels this. Maybe there's something we can do about this. And so I created this tool called the Change Maker Canvas. And the goal with it is to help make change from something that feels complex and hard to grasp and instead be a tactical, tangible tool for helping you get one, clarity on what needs to change, and then two, steps on how to actually affect change. The goal is you use the canvas upfront at the beginning of a change effort. And you put some thinking into it and it walks you through all of the things you need to consider to start leading change. So that mm -hmm. way, once you've done the hard work, and you filled out the canvas, then you no longer have to think. <laughs> then at that point, you move into doing mode. You know what to do, and it gives you a bit more courage to step up and to start leading. Oh, so it's something like a map for a change when you, when you are planning your trip and um, it shows you where to go, it shows you which steps to take. So let me bring, bring it up front. And this is the one. Uh, we, it will be on our record and, um, yeah, people will see, it, uh, but you know, it by heart. So would you describe more about how did it, uh, appear in your mind? I, I know that the periodical table of elements supposedly was shown to Dr. Mendeleev in his dreams. Maybe you had a dream about <laughs> or something. I'm not that smart. No, this, this took... Just a hard work, no, no brilliant flash like that. But what, when I thought about it, I wanted to bring together all the things we need to think about in leading change. 
And so many of the tools take on one part of the change, but not the whole picture. And so in this, I wanna make sure we do both the big picture, the vision of change. We can talk more about that. The why behind it, what's the motivation? But then also we get into the very tactical steps of, well, what's your first step? Or what are some of the things that could go wrong? And how do we make sure that we plan for them? So at the same time, this one piece of paper is very high level, conceptual, but also very practical and tangible. You know, this idea of uh, developing a vision, it's um, as practical as philosophical. Can you teach a person to develop a vision? Are there any steps that uh, when, well, well, let me put it like this. When a person is led from within and there are some people that cannot resist being change makers, then they come to you to the business school at a certain level when they already had developed the skill. But also I see some, at least some people who um, come up to study and they say something like, okay, my position in the company says a leader of something. Uh, I never thought about myself as a leader. And now my up, uh, higher management wants me to develop a vision for the development of my department. I don't see anything. What do you do? What would you recommend? What steps would you bring these people through to help? I understand we cannot push them to help, to draw, to attract them to develop this vision. Great question. And I would do two things. The first, start with some data. James Kuzis and Barry Posner who are professors at Santa Clara University, they did a study interviewing tens of thousands of people. And they asked them two questions. What are the traits, the characteristics that you look for in a peer, in a colleague, someone on the same level? And what are the characteristics you look for in a leader? So for both peers and for leaders, the number one trait was honesty. So we want honest leaders, we want honest peers. But then interestingly, the biggest gap by far between what we look for in a leader and what we look for in a peer is vision, being forward looking. Only 27% of people want that in a peer, but 72% want it in a leader, a 45 point gap. So that means that to be a leader, we need to get practice with vision. But again, it can feel scary. We might say, well, I'm just an IT person. I'm not a vision person. But I would say, yes, you can be a vision person. And so when I teach vision, I say it needs three things. So first, it needs to be grounded in why. Simon Sinek, of course, has a famous TED talk about start with why. But what's the reason that you're doing this thing in the first place? What's your motivation? You can't fake that. You've got to be passionate, but find that reason that gets you going. Why do you want to lead this change? Connect with that. But then secondly, it has to be clear and it has to be compelling. And you can even put that on a graph like this, where you can say, how clear is it? And how compelling is it? We often think though, that as leaders, we needed to go inside our office or go on a retreat and then have this magic moment where you go, okay, this is the vision. But actually visions can be a bit collaborative. You can ask your team for feedback on the vision. You could share some thoughts. You could talk with customers about the vision, or you could even get inspiration from what other companies or competitors do. Now you need to make the vision your own. You need to make sure it's part of your why, and it's clear and it's compelling. But if you feel stuck and you're looking at a blank piece of paper, well, you can start taking some steps and you don't have to get it perfect right away. I remember working with uh, an executive. She was a new manager managing a team of four people and she wanted to have a vision about how she would be a leader. And she was so scared. So we worked with her on some of the things she might like to put into her vision. But then I told her, go ask your team, see what they think. 
And she was scared, but she asked the team and she got some feedback and she found that there was one piece of the vision which was missing, something they really wanted from her. And so based on that feedback, she incorporated that into her vision as well. So it doesn't have to be solo, but to be a leader, you do need to have a vision. Hmm. Um, some leaders are attracted to their vision, vision uh, so much then they forget about operational things. Um, what would be an indicator of <clears throat> an optimal level of vision that it doesn't, that uh, I'm trying to find it a necessary word that it may become your passion, but it doesn't become something that is like a drug uh, brings you in without, and you forget about anything around. Yeah. That's exactly right. And in Silicon Valley, we have some of those leaders who are all vision and no execution. An approach I like is as a leader, as a change maker, remain clear on your why, but flexible on your how. That means that you stay true to that vision, but you recognize that there may be many different paths to get to that point. Hmm. When I launched Start Some Good, my social enterprise with my co-founder, we wanted to help change makers all around the world with everything they needed. Our goal was to help people start doing good. We said, okay, people need financial capital. They need money to get started. They need intellectual capital. They need advice and strategy to get started. And they need social capital. They need support and volunteers to get started. And so we said, okay, we're going to do all of these things. But we quickly realized that if we tried to do all of these, our team was only four people. There was no way we could do all of those. So we said, okay, let's start with one. Let's start with financial capital. And that's where we began. And then after about five years, we got enough traction, had built a bigger team. We said, okay, now it's time to bring in intellectual capital. And we launched... Um, a conference and other events. In doing so, we were able to because we stayed clear on our why. That why didn't change, but our how did change. Our how met the market where it was to find the right path forward and took time, but we did so being clear on our why. Interesting. Um, and basically you started answering my question, which to me means that we are going in a right in a right direction together. It's about execution and it's about persistence and developing your persistence, but finding, um, I'm, I'm all about balance as you understand, finding a balance between being in persistent without, without being stubborn. Because yeah. yes, you need to put some efforts into um, achieving your goal, but if you put all in, and you don't achieve your goal, then you lose an opportunity to pivot or to start another venture. Where, and a lot of people are asking, and that's again, one of the terms that we use in one of our courses at the pre-MBA uh, management and leadership, which I was talking about. It's called now, it's a fashion term, the slash career. Like I have a general career, but I'm also a slash blogger or a slash um, you know, designer or slash something. And it's not my major activity, I make money somewhere else, but I do this for fun and then for a uh, little money and then I may, it may become my second career for, for something. One of, um, uh, it, like it, it's a strange career, but one of the friends of my wife, she was a fencer for fun. And now she's fencing for a veterans team in US Olympic, like Olympic veterans team. So it's a strange transition into a slash career. But again, how much effort do you think you should put into your um, change not to lose everything if you fail? Let's put it like this. Yeah, such an important question to balance it. I have two thoughts here. The first, there's a design firm in the US, now global, called IDEO. And they're the ones who, among other things, they're famous for helping Apple invent the very first computer mouse. It's a very creative company. And when they hire people, 
they hire people that they say are called a T-shaped person, letter T in the American alphabet. So that means that you have the vertical line is your area of expertise. So if they're hiring a financial person, that means that person knows how to do Excel modeling and profit loss balance sheets, et cetera. But they also want that top part of the T as well. And they define that as broad-based curiosity that mm. you know a little bit about a lot of different things. I think that's a really helpful framework for us as change makers as well. So you do want to have that area where you can go deep, that change you're really passionate about, but not get so stuck on any one path that you kind of can't see out from there. So you have that broad base of curiosity, you know, a little bit about all these other things. Maybe it's many slashes at the top that you could then put into practice if you need. But even if you don't need it, even if you just have one traditional career, it makes you a more interesting and more well-rounded person. The, well, please. Please, please, please. Yeah, I'm listening. No, then the second thought is fascinating research that's done by Italian researchers. They looked at entrepreneurs who were in an incubator in Italy. And they just did one simple intervention. With one half of the entrepreneurs, they taught them the scientific method. So that's hypothesis testing. And what they found is that the entrepreneurs who learned the scientific method were more likely to pivot and generated almost twice as much revenue. So why is that? It's because a scientist, when they sit in a lab, if an experiment doesn't work out, they don't say, oh, I'm such a bad scientist. I got that wrong. No, they say, okay, that experiment didn't work. Let me try another one. But as entrepreneurs and as leaders, we often get so scared to try something new because the failure will look bad on us. So when these entrepreneurs learned about the scientific method, that made them more likely to pivot. You call that a, a change in direction because it was no longer a sign of weakness or failure if they changed direction. Instead, it was a smart thing, like a good scientist who's getting closer and closer and closer to the right answer. So perhaps you could think of yourself as a T-shaped person or perhaps think of yourself as a scientist. Well, I remember when the pandemic started, it was so long ago, and uh, we didn't know where will it go. And we had our um, uh, thesis defenses here at school, but we realized that uh, some of the people were quarantined and they couldn't come. And immediately we decided, okay, let's gather together. And we had our first defense over Skype. Yeah, we, we used it, you know, when uh, something goes wrong, go back to your roots. And we went back to Skype and it worked and fine. But within two weeks, uh, we went and started using, I think, the basic version of Zoom. We quickly analyzed all the market and yeah, Zoom was the quickest and the cheapest and the easiest for us to, to master. So yeah, it doesn't work. Do something else and try it again and try it again and try it again, and then you will get it. Well, it's not so easy to not to lose faith in the process, but it's so very important to do this hypothesis, uh, hypothesis testing. Yeah, cool. Um, I understand there are more steps and I understand that we could just go through your book during our conversation and it is very interesting. Could you, um, probably after you've developed the canvas, you had some cases of uh, innovations or changes using the model. Normally we see something and we make a model out of it, but then when the model is already developed, we can say, don't invent a wheel. Here's a model, it will um, speed up your change. Could you bring me a case where a company or a group of people use the change maker canvas and uh, it was good for them. Yeah, there's been a number of cases which has been delightful to see. Uh, one example are students of mine who wanted to increase the number of people who donated blood. Uh, so people when they need blood at hospitals get more people to donate. They found that their generation, so people aged 
22 to 27, weren't donating blood nearly as much. And so they spent time trying to understand the problem. And you'll see in the canvas that we dedicate three blocks to the problem. It's not just one. There's a quote which is often attributed to Albert Einstein. It's not clear if he actually said this, but it's a great quote. He says, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about the solution. So we really wanna spend time in the problem. And what's helpful for them is understanding, well, what's the core problem? So in their case, it was trying to increase the number of people age 22 to 27 who donate blood, then identify the consequences. What happens if they don't get engaged now? For instance, 10 years from now, will they also not be donating blood? And then also the root causes. What are the things underlying it that lead to that? So it's not just putting a Band-Aid on a cut, but making sure people don't get cut in the first place. And so as they thought about this, they moved from just you know, bringing a van to campus to do mobile blood donations to instead thinking about how do they change the way that hospitals collect blood? They found that there were rules and regulations and policies that got in the way of people who wanted to donate blood. And so they took this much wider and much deeper lens to trying to solve this problem instead of just the first thought, which might have been a simple startup, which would have just been an app or something. And so I love that as an example of really sitting with the problem to deeply understand it and then come up with a better solution as a result. Well, one of the Ukrainian companies that is uh, also taking blood and pr producing plasma, blood, blood plasma, they found out that in this process, people spend enormous amount of time, amount of time filling papers before they do this. And uh, the um, organizational consultant, a uh, successful business person who was working on them with this problem said, okay, if it's first time, I can understand, but people are filling in the same and the same and the same information. If they're coming to you regularly, why do you find them instead of uh, supporting them in this desire? And they, that's where they started changing their process. So it's interesting that in different countries, these processes are going simultaneously. So it probably means that the model works. What would you change? Let me put it like this. What would you change in yourself so that the canvas model for you would be even better than it is now? Hello. It looks like Alex is a bit offline. Let's give us a minute and he will reconnect. Well, I'll talk for a little bit. Yeah, he's going to reconnect in a minute. So I'll keep speaking English just for our interpreter to keep uh, helping you um, listen it in Ukrainian. As soon as Alex connects, we have another five minutes to continue. So uh, this model, you can uh, uh, search for it using a change maker in the a change maker canvas in Google. And it is really simple. It's on my screen and in the, or on your screen now, six rows, and it looks like canvas. So when we were preparing for this discussion, it was, well, just a second. Somebody raised a hand. No? Okay, just a second, okay. Yeah, just a second, just a second, Alex, okay. Yeah, Alex is showing up. Hello, Alex. Hi, I'm so sorry, Wi-Fi cut out. I just need to have video ability turned back on. That's okay, that's no problem. Yep, doing it in a second. Yeah, hi. Okay, good. Back online. So, 
Uh, that's okay. So I understand that the stress reaction is one of the things that you should develop in yourself when uh, going through a change. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And I, when I rejoined, it sounded like you were doing a great job presenting the canvas. I should just <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I love your model. And when I'm excited about a model, that's fantastic. So let me bring you back the question. What would you change in yourself so that the canvas model would be even better for you than it is now? And me, myself personally, or someone using? Yeah, the canvas? you as a change maker. If you apply this model to yourself, what would you, what would you change? How would you improve you or maybe you in your business or in your teaching? Oh, thank you. Yeah, so I am a brand new author, as we talked about. And that's a skill that most academics don't learn. We know how to write, but we don't know how to promote. <laughs> and so now with the book out into the world, my publisher is asking me to do the marketing and do the promotion. And so I think I should use the Changemaker Canvas to better understand how I can tell people about the book and get people excited about the book because it does not come naturally to me. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll be finalizing with a set of questions about our country going through a process of change. And I'll try to be academic, which is not so easy because talking about change in the middle of the hurricane is, doesn't help you, you know, examine it, but let's give it a try. Um, when a company or a country is going through a change, it is stressful. And uh, if you are a change maker and you are changing someone or somebody or a group of people, then you're a little bit above the change. But what would you recommend to people who are inside the change? during this change. Yeah, thank you. And again, I am so inspired by the courage of your nation and the way that you've stood up. I mean, it's, you have a number of Americans behind you and certainly myself. So thank you for all of your courage. And I don't know that I have any great wisdom to share because I think you all are the experts here. You have the wisdom, um, but perhaps it's being able to take that long-term view so I'm inspired by the words of Matthew Kelly in the book, The Long View. He says, we tend to overestimate what we can do in a day, underestimate what we can do in a month, overestimate what we can do in a year, and underestimate what we can do in 10 years. And I think when you're in the middle of a change effort, you can lose track of time. And I think especially so in time of war and conflict. Um, but to be able to zoom out a bit and have some of that perspective that could perhaps can be helpful in the midst of change. Well, um, fantastic. Uh, I have nothing to add, but you know what? I'm waiting for your new publication. I understand that the first book is like a first jump with a parachute. You will always want to do the second one. What are your thoughts about new articles or a new area of research or a new development for your book? Would you share? Oh, what a great question. Um, <laughs> honestly, I don't know. I don't know quite yet. Part of what's so exciting about this book is that it's now getting out to people around the world. And I hope that there will one day be a Ukrainian translation. So if there's any translators in the room, please talk to me. But um, I want to hear from people all around the world how they apply the lessons and what some of the things are that they still need. And so I think I'll do a bit of market research here and say, what do people think of the book? What helps them? And what are their questions? And then once I know that, then I'll come in perhaps with book number two. Well, you know, uh, with your permission, I'll study the, uh, the canvas deeper and maybe I'll uh, ex experiment with it in my class with uh, our students uh, who go through the change or who do the change. And let's see how it goes. And I promise you to write about the results of the experiment and I'll give you your contacts for them to contact you directly, which would be a nice um, extension of your study into this part of the world. Please do, I would be honored, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the conversation. This. Um, our time, it, the time really flies. And um, I'm fantastically happy about our discussion. 
I like how it went. And uh, I'm thankful to you for your ability to join two times, like from <laughs> different Wi-Fi's, which was so fine. And I see you, our attendees are uh, thanking you too. So thank you so very much, Alex. Have a good time. Have a good day today. It's my privilege to be with you and your amazing community. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you for the conversation. Uh, and please keep in touch and let me know how I can support all of you as change makers. Thank you so very much. Goodbye. Колеги, я завершу нашу сьогоднішню зустріч. Ще раз подякую вже українською нашому колезі за те, що він сьогодні виступав. Він сказав, що він буде вивчати українську, тому, можливо, він вже декілька слів знає. Але дійсно, оця ідея змін, ідея управління змінами завдяки канвасу, завдяки науковцям, завдяки науковим підходам, вона дає можливість ні, не відчувати, що можна обійтись без змін, але скоріше зробити зміни такими, що вам буде опанувати їх швидше, процес цей зробити простіше і більш передбачуваним, я б так сказав. Ми разом з вами, як бізнес-школа, проходимо через цей процес змін. І ми проходимо через нього завдяки нашим програмам при МБА, завдяки тому, що е, ми запрошуємо вас долучатись, навчатись разом з вами. Ми, як викладачі, протягом вашого навчання зазвичай розбираємо не тільки академічні кейси, але і ті кейси, що створюються безпосередньо в процесі нашого з вами навчання. Нагадую, що ми з вами сьогодні починали з розмови про програму менеджмент і лідерство, програму бізнес-школи МІМ, яка, власне, і є одною з практично людських програм в МІМі. Це програма про людей. Але зараз протягом змін ми надали їй ще і бізнес-тач, такого відтінку серйозного бізнесу для того, щоб ті, хто будуть навчатися, вони розвивали не тільки себе, а й свої компанії. Дякую, колеги з першої бізнес-школи України, МІМ Київ. З вами був Олександр Сударкін, директор програми при МБА менеджмент лідерства, директор програми МБА. На все добре, побачимось, друзі.